I'm Bill Ray of Willits, William Ray, W.J. Ray, they sometimes call me. Um, we're in the Carnegie Library, which has become a media center, but it's carried on the tradition of truth and greater knowledge. And that's what we're in pursuit of today. Our subject is Shakespeare and who was he? Uh, we've been taught since childhood that Shakespeare is this individual, which our instincts tell us cannot be true because this is not a true person. It's more of a caricature than a person in comparison. This we know is a person, the girl with the pearl earring that Vermeer uh, painted a likeness of. For instance, we know this is a person even though we uh, don't know her personally because the distance from the forehead to the chin is reflected in the distance from the middle of the ear to the front of the face, and that's a golden section. The golden proportion is that ratio between one line and another, such that the shorter to longer length is the same ratio as the longer distance is to the combined length. So it's a constant one to 1.62 ratio, making an organic harmony. So there's an inherent harmony in the human face and in all beautiful things, in flowers, sunflowers, all forms of creation, including the human body. But why this would be presented, this falsehood would be presented as a true portrait is at the root of our study here. Why did they have to uh, tell us a lie somewhere at the beginning of the whole saga. And that began with the first folio. Before that, William Shakespeare of Stratford was not known for writing. He was not known as a writer, a poet, a playwright. He was a money lender, a grain broker. He invested in what they called then the Lord Chamberlain's players. He did that for money. He bought and sold properties for money, but he was not an artist in any way, and nobody ever said that he was, including his family. So how did William Shakespeare get involved with this whole mystery? The reason was that William Shakespeare sounds like William Shakespeare. William Shakespeare was the pseudonym for the true author of the Shakespeare canon. And there's become a widespread study that Edward de Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford, used Shakespeare as his pseudonym. So the combination of that pseudonym and this uh, person that we've come to call Shakespeare are intimately tied up in a hoax, a necessary hoax to hide the greater truth. And that truth was that a high nobleman wrote the Shakespeare canon as the foundational narrative of his country serving his queen and the culture of the plays that he wrote and the poetry that he wrote would be the glory of her reign. Now we'll go into how this portrait tells a story or gives a message of the way that both the author and the imposter, let's call him an imposter, although his name was taken after he died, it tells the story or gives a message of the both of them. I'm going to 
tell you the another story, and that's the story of my discovering of some of these secrets. And we all like secrets because we want the truth. We have a natural instinct for the truth. Now, I looked at this ridiculous picture, and I, I couldn't understand why it had to be there. And since I made the study of Edward de Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford, I realized that it had to be there both as a way to fool the public or, or hide a, an un inconvenient and possibly dangerous truth and to tell that truth at one and the same time. So let's look at it. On our left are two spears, and this is about Shakespeare. So here are two spears, but on our right are four spears. Now we know this asymmetrical design would not pass any uh, marketing standard. In fact, the, the designer or seamstress or whatever would be fired if they made a creation like this. But it does make sense as a pun. Two in French is deux. Four, there's four spears here. Four in German is vier. Put these two together and you have de vier. Or a very close approximation of de vier. Then, Let's look at this kind of a rectangle on the collar. Uh, if we imagine these spears as a four-tined E, then the O can be imagined or interpreted as E O. We don't see this on the other side. Again, it's asymmetrical. So, so far we have de vir e o, Earl of Oxford. But we're just speculating right now. Let's try to interpret these two lines, these two embroidery patches here. De, here's a V shape of illumination, which you would never see in reality, because there's also an illumination coming from this side. Da, the, ear. We can imagine another V made of this uh, strange uh, shadowing. Da, the, ear. And the, eye, the eyebrow goes right to the ear. Now, this isn't an ear, it's actually a nose that's pointing down into this crease, which nobody has been able to understand. But it is understandable as a V, a long V that ends at the ear. So, da, the, ear. They're playing games with us. That, that children would enjoy uh, interpreting symbols from. Three times it says De Vere, as well as this saying De Vere, Earl of Oxford. Well, that'll give you an idea that this is a message system by which the artist and uh, whoever instructed the artist was playing a double game on us. So I looked at this huge face, and I measured it. And this is a, uh, an actual size depiction of the first folio frontispiece. It's exactly four inches. Now, we already learned from looking at this that veer is a homonym of de veer, and veer in German means four and this is four inches. The center of a circle that starts right under the, just at the bottom of the eye and to your left of the eye. 
So this is four inches and it's three inches from that same center of the circle to the point of this collar tip or what they called a, uh, a wire rough. So if this was exactly four inches and this is exactly three inches, there's an, an ulterior motive here. So I measured this and I found that it's also three inches from the edge of the print to that exact point. And that this makes a 70 degree angle. So I used that as an example and made a 70 degree angle at the bottom of the three inch length. And that ended up over here somewhere making a 40 degree angle. Now 40 is very important and reoccurs in the Shakespeare canon an unusual number of times over a hundred times. 40 uh, in symbolism is a combination of four for veer which sounds like de veer and zero which looks like O and O is the first letter of his of his title Earl of Oxford. So here we have a triangle. At first, I didn't know what it was for, but then I decided that if there's one on this side, there should be one on the other side. So I measured from the gleam on the eye to the opposite color point. Also exactly three inches. So I just drew in a 70 degree angle here, a 70 degree angle here, making another 40. Now this is starting to look like something. It looks like a star, but it doesn't have a peak to it. So I measured from the uh, center of the crown to the collar point exactly five inches exactly five inches so I drew a, a, a triangle to those dimensions and this is what we have here so we have a, a peak and, and uh, two points to the star, all of them 40 degree angles. So some is good and more is better. There has to be a couple more uh, star points lower down, but, but where do you measure from? Well, <clears throat> I measured from this collar point to the fourth button, because we were talking about veer meaning four. And that's what we have here. And then on the other side, to the same button, another star. So the uh, skeptic would say, well, so what if they drew a star invisibly into this picture as the basis for the picture? What we have here is the Veer arms with the family crest, which is unique in all heraldry, English heraldry, because the angles are all 40 degrees. It's a five-pointed star of 40 degrees each point. Here's an example of it on my tie. Uh, somebody from England, Darren Charlton, sent me this tie when I told him I was going to give a lecture about De Veer. And the tie has the crest on it. You can see the star right up in the left upper quarter. Just to be complete, there's a variation for this peak. 
because we're talking about sacred geometry here, which is something that they believed in as an explanation for the universe and as a, uh, as a symbol of understanding the universe. Now you see these five dots on the picture. Uh, there are not five dots on the other side. You see? So this is a signal of another meaning that's sort of superimposed onto the first meaning. And if we draw another triangle, pretty much the same, but reaching to this point, to the fifth dot, then er everything fits. Let's see if we can get to that button. Everything fits. But we have a 47 degree angle instead of a 40 degree angle. Why is 47 important? Because of Euclid's theorem 47, which was very important in the classical tradition, because that was the theorem that explained the golden triangle. 90 degree angle here, 3 inches here, 4 inches at the height, five inches on the diagonal. This is the way they explained increase or creativity. Three squared plus four squared equals five squared. In other words, out of the combination of two, yet a third could be created. That was their concept of creativity. So we have a, an opening here in the center and we fill that in with this. And these are both 50 degree angles. Why 50? Because five is the number of royalty. This is not only a tribute to creativity, it's a statement saying that creativity is royal, it's high, it's up with the gods. And the other angle, 50 plus 50 is 100, and that makes that an 80 degree angle. Eight is the number of infinity, meaning this is eternally true. This d didn't happen by accident. And incidentally, to that triangle, there was a, a pedestal, which um, looked like about this, going to the fourth button. So it wasn't just hanging in the air. Now I'll show you a picture of the uh, portrait with the structure of the portrait superimposed on it. And you can see that critical points of the picture are determined by critical points of the star. And the star is a Veer star, but there's more to it than that. The circle that I first mentioned from uh, chin to crown is a four inch circle. And there's another four inch circle with this huge arm ruff. If you completed it, they cut off the picture because uh, they could only make it so big. And this four inch circle duplicates this four inch circle. And if you count down four buttons, to here, that's the center of another four inch circle. So, so far we have three four inch circles, four meaning veer, and then there's a three inch circle that kind of joins them all together. That's not only necessary in order to uh, get a picture out of this, to get a, a halfway human face out of this, but three is the number for the secret in the classical tradition. All, all good things come in threes. Tria sunt omnia. And this tells the person that could understand in the classical tradition, but this was written not only to be understood, but from the power of the symbols themselves that they would last forever. It just happened that now we're studying the issue and we're getting interested in, in why this all came about. So the four circles together make that same 40, that is 4-0, that we saw in the angles. Four for veer, 
O for Oxford, and there's four of them, four O. And this will explain the pedestal a little bit. Uh, the, the reason they uh, put the uh, printing as they did is that this says E-O, which is uh, Earl of Oxford initials, and this says I-O, which is not E-O, but in Italian, the first person singular for I is pronounced E-O. In other words, in his writing at times in the uh, Shakespeare canon, he would refer to himself in terms of I-O. And if you understand Italian, you know that's E-O, uh, which sounds out phonetically as the Earl of Oxford's uh, initials. And this 40 degree angle goes right to the fourth button. So uh, whoever did this was a genius of compression. And I'll show you what the uh, structure looks like without the picture, but you know that the picture is in there. Here we see the, the three four inch circles. Here's the three inch circle. Here's the peak of the uh, triangle that goes to the collar points from the crown of the head. Here's where the, the shoulder ruff is. This is the center where the torso is, and this is the head and the three inch circle we just talked about. Incidentally, there's a microcosm. I'll point this out to you just quickly. If, if you start at the uh, center of the three inch circle, and in other words, measure an inch and a half, uh, you have an O here, the eyeball, we can call that an O. You have an O here, which is this little moon-shaped thing. Um, you have an O here, this button is displaced so it falls within the circuit and let's see, it, it comes around right through the nostril, which is a nominal O, but it's still an inch and a half from here. So there are four O's in miniature, not only the four big circles, but the four O's that originate with the smaller circle. Here's one more little secret. I mentioned the I-O idea. So um, we want to see if he's embedded or not he, but the, the illustrator and the mastermind behind this have embedded the I-O, which is E-O in Italian, Earl of Oxford. Well, here's an I, a thick I, and here's the little moon-shaped thing, I-O. And here's an I, and this button has been moved over. See, it's out of line in order to make an I-O. And if we call this an O, then this septum makes an I. It's much clearer if you look on a, uh, a, a better print. This is an I, and this is an O. Here you see a Roman numeral I, which is right here, and then there's a little moon shape here. You have to get a magnifying glass to see this uh, very clearly. And then right here is an I, that is a real I, but there's an O shape around it with this impossible illumination that lights up this only and, and nothing around it. And if you make a line, Let's get my ruler. If you make a line from this I-O through this I-O, you come to a third I-O, which we've just seen. Now, in total, there are uh, not three, not four, not five, but 50 little signals here uh, referring to the identity of the Earl of Oxford, Edward de Vere.
And why 50? Because as we saw before, 50 refers to royalty. He was a high noble, and his duty, the way that he served His Majesty Elizabeth I, uh, was a royal duty to uh, create the fo foundational narrative of his race. And that's what he did with the histories. Something that uh, the ear that's really a nose reminds me of is that there are other optical illusions in the uh, portrait here. We think this is an ear because that's where an ear should be. It's actually a nose. And you can just trace the line of the forehead of the uh, person that is uh, looking into this crease saying, uh, what the hell is this? Let's look into this further. There's another optical illusion. So uh, let's turn the figure on its side. And right here, this odd scar or whatever uh, you might interpret it to be turns out to be the head of a boar. And the boar is the heraldic animal of the Veer family. And we see that the mouth upside down is an ox's skull and horns. And he's looking into this O O for Oxford, O-X, uh, also thinking, let's look into this darkness. And if you use a magnifying glass on a good copy, you can see that there is a 40 degree on the side triangle embedded in this darkness. So the answer to the question, who is this, is answered by the triangle. It's a 40 degree triangle, 4 O, 4 for Veer, O for Oxford. It's child's play, but it's worthwhile to play and find out the truth. Now you're probably wondering, this cannot be De Vere because it can't be anybody. It's not really a person. There's no a uh, golden section anywhere on that face. It's just a caricature. But what did De Vere look like? This was De Vere as a young man when he arrived in Paris in 1575. You can see that he has noble appointments. The cape this light cape and the heavier cape could only be worn by the nobility. There are 14 buttons, just like there are 14 buttons, the Drouchot portrait figure, but they're on a normal frame, 14 symbolizing 14 verses and a sonnet. And then on his cap or bonnet are nine medallions symbolizing the nine muses of poetry. He was recognized even then as a great poet. And this is what he looked like about 15 years later. You can see from a looking at his face, he's a person of extreme, almost painful sensitivity. A man without a skin, almost. But everything in, in these uh, portraits has meaning. Here we see the skull. He was already known at that time for Hamlet. And there is a famous scene in Hamlet about his holding a skull. And here is a book. We're not sure what book it is, but we can guess it might be Cardanus Comforte, which was the book that most affected the writing of Hamlet. This is a, a cut-off portrait. It was so damaged that somebody cut it off. It, this was a full-length sword, and only nobility could have a sword like this. And here is a thumb ring, which was covered up in the bastardized version of this portrait, and it has a boar on it. 
So we know for sure that this is Edward de Vere for the curious. This is the person who suffered and wrote and knew that uh, his name would be buried with his body. He said so in one of his poems. It's a tragic story, but also an heroic one because he gave up everything, his wealth, his status, his position, his honor, the honor of having his name on his work so that the works could survive at all. I've given you a, uh, you know, an extremely b brief explanation of these secrets embedded in the Drew Show portrait, the frontispiece of the first folio. And I've indicated some of the history. But people ask me, well, what does it matter who wrote it? But they don't really mean that question. It's kind of a defensive response to an injustice that has been done. But they're trying to say, well, it was an injustice, but so what? The truth always matters. It matters in a cultural sense in that if there's no truth, there is no justice. And from childhood forward, we know what justice and injustice is. In this case, justice is recognizing the true author. Justice is recognizing that there's a hidden history. Justice is recognizing that human creativity doesn't come from nowhere. It comes from the soul of the creator. And uh, the story that we've been told that uh, William Shakespeare traveled from Stratford-upon-Avon, uh, arrived in London, and all of a sudden was writing plays is a fantasy. It's not the truth. And we should get these things straightened out. A falsehood at the very core of our literary tradition is not a good thing. It's unwholesome. It's corrupt. It's wrong. Uh, so I'm speaking mainly to the children now because uh, we adults uh, are probably comfortable with the lies that we have told ourselves and told each other. But um, you're not. Children will not have anything but what is true and what is just. And this is your work for the future. And uh, I'd be glad to assist in that as I pass the age of 70. And since I've said 70, I'd like to dedicate what I've said to our friend and neighbor, Glenwood Wagner, who is struggling for his life right now in Willits. He didn't know a damn thing about Shakespeare, didn't care to, but he loved the truth, and he loved to hear it, and uh, he was one with all humanity in that. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you.